Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of California Employment News, an offering from the Labor and Employment Group at Weintraub Tobin. My name is Megan Bainbridge, and with me is my partner, Lucas Clary. And today we're going to talk a little bit about remote work as we maneuver out of a COVID world and into a world where hopefully uh, there's more employees working in the office, but also, you know, it, it appears that there is a lot of interest to also work from home. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Lucas, what's one piece of advice you give to employers who are offering remote or hybrid work to their employees? Thanks, Megan. Well, one thing, one place I always like to start, I think the first thing to establish when you're evaluating these arrangements is whether the employer is requiring or requesting that employees work remotely as opposed to just allowing an employee to do so at their own request. The reason that this distinction matters is because when the need to work remotely arises from an employer request, it will trigger the need to potentially reimburse the employee's expenses associated with creating that remote work environment. So California law, as, as you may know, requires employers to reimburse all reasonable and necessary employee business expenses. And in the context of a remote work environment, this could mean providing or reimbursing employees for things such as their computer, uh, a phone potentially, or, or a mobile phone, Wi-Fi even, or the electricity bill and things such as a workstation desk or other work equipment if it's necessary to do the job. Megan, outside of reimbursing potential business expenses, what else should employers look out for with remote work environments? Well, it's important for employers to remember that the labor code still applies even when you can't see your employees. So this means that non-exempt employees are um, subject to the very same overtime rules and meal and rest break rules as all other employees that you uh, see in your office. It's inherently more difficult to monitor an employee who you can't see. And remote work means that it's easier for employees to um, claim timekeeping violations, off the clock work, missed meal and rest breaks and things like that. So first with respect to overtime, the main thing that employers need to um, remember is that overtime is owed even when it's not pre-authorized. So work that's not requested but is suffered or permitted is work time and it must be paid. This is true even if employee has actual knowledge of that work or just constructive knowledge. So, you know, let's take conference calls, for instance. Are those being scheduled outside normal work hours? If so, that um, those are hours that are implicitly acknowledged and authorized by the employer. Similarly, emails and text messages that are being exchanged outside normal work hours. Again, that the exchange of those emails and texts are implicitly um, implicit knowledge of that work being performed and that time must be paid. So what it's important to do is to train your supervisors and managers to notice, are employees responding to emails outside the work hours? Are they performing work outside of those hours? And if they are ensuring that that time is being um, paid because that you have at that point constructive knowledge of the work being performed. With respect to meal breaks, it's important to have a policy that requires employees to take their meal breaks. So, you know, you have the general policy that says that your company provides an opportunity for meal breaks, encourages your employees to take them. Also, uh, in a previous uh, video session, we talked about uh, the case that came out last year where the uh, appellate court explicitly authorized a system where an employee on a day-to-day -day basis or at least pay period by pay period basis acknowledges and that they are permitted to take their meal breaks. So to the extent you can put forth a policy and a practice where when someone's recording their time, they explicitly state they were provided an opportunity to take a break, that will be um, incredibly helpful to fight against claims that come along down the road where suddenly there's an allegation that a meal period was not permitted. Uh, Lucas, do you have any other advice for employers? Uh, yes, uh, Megan, I think the next step after you take all of the things Megan just pointed out and the stuff I was talking about a minute ago about uh, business expenses and the like, once you come to an understanding of what the arrangement is that governs this employee, you want to document that arrangement in the, by way of a telecommuting agreement with the employee that would be signed by both someone on behalf of the employer and by the employee. So if the remote arrangement comes via the employee's request, the telecommuting agreement should reflect that so that the business isn't prone to uh, arguments down the road that it should have been reimbursing the employee for business expenses. 
Uh, on the other hand, if not, if, if, if it is the employer mandating the uh, arrangement, then it should reflect what the employee will be reimbursed for and what that process would be for obtaining approval to incur expenses. It should also clarify the employee's need to take breaks and accurately report hours uh, for the reasons Megan was just mentioning. I think those are the big uh, takeaways for the purposes of boiling this down to a five minute uh, discussion. And uh, if you focus on those things and document it in an agreement, you should be in good shape. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us for this installment of California Employment News. You can continue to find us by subscribing to our YouTube channel or on our blog at lelawblog.com. We'll see you next time. Bye everyone.